hi all a very good evening uh, and uh, i would like to thank first of all do and peter for joining us today and i welcome all of you at the taoism and agility webinar so let's get started so we'll start with a you know small introduction about the innovation rules we'll talk about the logistics required for the webinar i'll give you a small small introduction about the do sal and peter mel then I'll hand over controls to Peter and Do to present the talk on terrorism and agility. Then hopefully we'll have a Q&A session. So innovation routes. We are skill transfer journeymen and trusted consulting providers of strategic methodology and technology advisory and solutions to enterprises building largest and innovative solutions. So we do provide agile consulting and coaching. We provide agile training and in-house and public. We are the CA Tech Continuous Delivery Suite Official Resellers. So logistic required for this webinar, I would request you to please use a LAN cable for joining this webinar. Wi-Fi connection are unstable. Use high quality speakers or headphones for better sounds quality. Please keep your microphones muted. All the questions will be taken via Q&A chat box. You can drop all your questions in Q&A chat box. The webinar will be recorded. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel, Innovation Roots, for all your upcoming events and past events. So Doe. Doe is an avid agilist who started his professional journey as a software developer and manager. The agile movement met his frustration 10 years ago. In, in time to become a scrum master, a product owner, and a, an agile coach. The more he worked, the more he felt transformation should focus on mindset and the will to change. Hence, Doe currently works closely with the HR department in addition to IT and helps tailor specific solution rather than apply a one process fits all approach. About Peter, Peter Miller is an Australian who contributed to formation of Agile Alliance, the first Wikipedia wiki engine and the Deism online cult a working software engineer, poet, and trans translator for three decades. Peter's current focus is in Xscale Alliance, the Linux of all, the Linux of the Agile world. Peter has led Agile transformation, startups, and open source projects, and for few years directed the Lippinwood Tea House Theater in the rainforest of Australia's Tweed Caldera. So over to Dave, Dow and Peter. First, let me unmute myself. You hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great. I'm unmuted now, too. Yeah, and now uh, let me share my screen. Do you see the slides? Um, I don't. Not yet. Okay, so I'll, I'll have to. Oh, yes, okay. Yeah. Oh, this what happened there. So now, uh, uh, mm -hmm. yes, I can see your screen now. Okay, so unfortunately, we'll do it without the video because I don't know how to share our video and, and the slides at the same time. But I no, we can we, see your screen. Uh, as well. You just uh, you just, just have to you know, yeah. Okay. So, so you um, let me start by yeah. You're good. I'm good, good. So uh, uh, thanks, Shirak. My name is Dov, and I, as I said, and um, the two things that really fascinate me um, and that are the reasons that we are here are agility and Taoism. Um, I discovered agility about 12 years ago, or more than 10, as you said, uh, and I found it a way to breathe life into an organization. Um, to help it have a sense of purpose, make it more aware and alert. And in parallel, I found something called the Book of Tao about uh, the same time. And um, I plunged into it six years ago, and the parallels between the two uh, strike me. So uh, a small introduction to what is Taoism, to anyone who doesn't know at all what it is. Taoism is a philosophy uh, which is based on a deceptively simple book that uh, we'll talk about today. 
it's a way of seeing the world as one entity or uh, perhaps seeing the world that the world is one entity that the world is just one thing and that all the things in it are interconnected nothing exists separately and all the divisions between yes and no right and wrong you and me are just figments of our imagination a, a way of our brain to dissect things a, how did I meet Peter? About a year ago, I wrote an article in LinkedIn about the connection between agility and Tao, and Peter responded and said that he translated the book of Tao, and we'll talk a lot about uh, translation today, into not only English, but agility. And this was very interesting, and I found the book fascinating. And that's how we got here. Um, so you introduced Peter, I won't do it again. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Book of Tao. Um, so the Book of Tao, the myth is uh, that it was created about 2,500 years ago, and it was written by a guy named Lao Tzu. Um, so 2,500 years ago, the Empire of China was in the middle of a big change. And the change was caused by prosperity. It was caused by the invention of iron. Once iron was invented, people could produce more out of their fields and commerce started and the fights about who owns what started and robbers on the road started and the empire of China started to crumble. And the emperor of China had three advisors. One of them was the, a representative of the army. One of them was a very wise guy called the Confucius. And one of them was the head of the library of China called the Lao Tzu. And uh, he asked them, what should I do? Uh, give me some advice. And of course, the army a representative said, use force, a put order in the kingdom by reinforcing uh, the law, by reinforcing, uh, by, by punishing the, the, the people who rebel. Confucius, who was uh, a very process oriented uh, person, said, what you should do is create a new religion. In this new religion, you will be the one who is most important. Below you will be the heads of the cantons and below them will be the heads of the family and below them will be the firstborn and below them will be all the other uh, male brothers and below them will be all the wives. And this way, almost no one will have the desire to, to uh, disturb the, the natural order that you will put in place. And the third guy, he, Lao Tzu, was a, was a strange character, as you can see in the picture. He, um, he used to uh, disappear barefoot into the woods for days and weeks, uh, talk to animals. And he had some strange ideas about how life is. And when uh, the emperor asked him, Basically, what Lao Tzu said is uh, shit happens, is whatever you, you will try to do forcefully will probably make more damage, just let things be. And of course, uh, even if the emperor respected this uh, advice, he couldn't take it. And he toggled between the, the force idea and, and the, the social order idea. And at the end, just like... Uh, most em empires, the empire crumbled. And Lao Tzu was already quite old. He asked the emperor, would you mind giving me uh, just one last uh, gift? I would love to have uh, my life and my favorite ox and uh, uh, go to um, a one-way trip to the Himalaya to, to that the first chapter, the last chapter of my life. And uh, the emperor loved Lao Tzu very much. 
he said, of course, he gave, granted him this gift. And after Lao Tzu he disappeared, he, the emperor said, in fact, I lost a huge source of knowledge and wisdom that, uh, and I have nothing left out of it. So he ordered all of the guards on the way to the Himalaya, if there's a strange man uh, with an ox uh, crossing the, the road, please stop him. And I guess he didn't say please, he was an emperor. Uh, stop him and uh, don't let him pass until he documents all the knowledge that he has. And that's what happened. So one guide on, on uh, the road to the Himalaya stopped out too. And um, told him that he has to document everything and every day Lao Tzu, every day Lao Tzu would uh, write one chapter and every evening I guess they would uh, drink some tea and when the, the book was done, 81 short chapters, Lao Tzu uh, thanked the God and went on the, the continuation of his one-way trip to the Himalaya. Only the story doesn't end there because uh, in fact, what Lao Tzu left to the god was a collection of uh, papers, or, uh, or uh, I guess it wasn't paper, but it was a script. And um, currently, there's millions, I guess, of uh, copies of the book. And what happened is that the emperor who got this book was the one who supported the publishing of it, who made the copies of it. And this, for me, makes the emperor a, a very big hero in the story because uh, when you read the book you see there's a lot of criticism um, some hidden but some very explicit toward power and riches and the uh, em emperorship um, one sentence uh, so from Dov, yes. I, I feel like i should interrupt you at this point Yes. Um, okay. Because that is indeed the, a, a very classical rendition of of the myth of uh, of Lao Tzu, but um, most of the actors in that myth never actually existed, including Lao Tzu himself. So while it's a beautiful story, um, Lao Tzu uh, is literally um, the old philosopher or the old philosophy. And there are stories about there being a gentleman named Lao Tan, but there's nothing that really suggests that we have any clear picture of where this work came from. We, there are some things we, we do know about it. We know that it was not originally in 81 chapters. That, that was uh, an invention of some religious numerologists that came long after the earliest editions of the book. And um, the, the picture of Lao Tzu on the ox and the more sort of new agey picture of, of Lao Tzu, the, 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 the beautiful stories that are told about Lao Tzu when you go looking for this stuff online, doesn't really have very much to do with the, the origin. Um, one of the things that really surprised me, so I, I should give a little bit of background on why I know anything about this stuff. Um, and so, because I kind of think the moment you start telling a story about uh, Lao Tzu, you're really telling the story about yourself and your aspirations and what was it that brought you to this idea. Uh, and so I, I feel like um, as someone who's translated Lao Tzu, if I don't talk a little bit about why, that um, it doesn't matter what stories I make up from thousands of years ago, I wasn't there, I'm here. So I, I think I should do that. I don't know. But I, I also feel like I'm interrupting your flow, Dov. So I don't want to do that. What I know, would you like for, to do? For me, it's wonderful. In fact, yeah. I would love to to hear your your take on it. We even prepared. You see this this uh, these two slides about the, the alternative views of of the uh, Lao Tzu, as you say. But what I would like to say about this is that even though I'm quite sure Lao Tzu didn't exist, when I read the book in any translation, his personality is very vivid to me. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. as a fictional character or as a non-fictional character, mm -hmm. when I read the book, I connect to his, um, 
a confusion to his a, a, um, there's some melancholy there like I, I really feel that I connect to the person who wrote the book even if there was no one single person or the story is totally not true the poetic truth is much more truthful to me than the historic one mm -hmm. but well, then I'll let so you continue. What, what I like about what you're saying is that you're right it is that the connection to the ideas and you feel like well they had to come from somewhere there had to be some sense, some origin. This began somewhere. Um, well, it's been through so many hands of so many generations of translators in so many languages. Um, even the idea that this is a poem that was invented by someone in China is dubious. So, um, but let me let me start with me, and then I'll I'll get to that bit. Um, so. One of the reasons I wanted to have the Latsu on the very left-hand side of the screen, which is from South Park. Um, so this is a modern humorous interpretation of Lao Tzu. Um, he, he brings to life a, a giant stone statue of John Wilkes Booth to assassinate a giant stone statue of Abraham Lincoln that's on the rampage. It's a typical South Park ridiculous plot. Um, using the power of Taoism. Uh, uh, well, okay. If, um, if there's any power in Taoism, uh, I, I think we're kind of missing the point. But I got involved with this stuff um, ooh, shortly after my father died, uh, in, when I was in my 20s. Uh, he had uh, an extensive library, and there were three English translations of Latzer. And since he didn't have three copies of any other book, I thought, well, I'd better look at these and figure out which one of these I like the best. Um, and, and as I was side by side, side, by side. they were all different. each of them was completely different they could have been different books uh, and i couldn't quite figure this out so I, I i started taking notes on the similarities and differences and a friend of mine pointed me uh, to the sinology mailing list that um that the australian national university was starting in those days very very early days of the internet um and this was a mailing list of um of sinology professors all around the world it was probably the, the first such community on the internet um, and I took my notes and I put them up there uh, suggesting well maybe this is a way to approach the work and I got lucky they tore them to shreds it was all rubbish nonsense it was just an intuition about what this work might mean and so um, I was very happy with that they um, they gave me feedback that even though I didn't speak Chinese, I, I, I could take their feedback and try to learn something about how to go about understanding this book. Um, and so I put another version up and they tore that to shreds. And I kept doing that for about three years. I'm pretty certain it was not the most pleasant experience from the other end. But at the end of the three years, um, they stopped, stopped tearing it to shreds. So either it wasn't so bad or they were getting bored. Um, but in any, any case, I felt like I'd got a bit of an education. I put a GNU public license on this thing and I decided to forget about it for, um, well, there were many other interesting things to do. Well, it came back into my life uh, a couple of times. Um, I discovered that a, a bunch of websites were using, really it was an interpolation, it wasn't a translation. It was called the the GNL, which stood for GNL is not Lao Tzu, it was a recursive factor. They were using it as the English translation. A bunch of Chinese sites were using it as the English translation. Uh, maybe they had very poor English and they, they didn't really understand what my words meant. I, I certainly didn't speak Chinese, so I didn't understand what their words meant, but they seemed to like it. Uh, and I discovered that what was at that time the most popular English language websites in China was using it as the English translation as chinapage.org. Um, so let me see, Dov is telling me something. Um, oh, just yes, okay. Um, so anyway, um, when I decided uh, to, to, to reinvest myself in the thing, it was partly because of that, and partly because of a gentleman named Oliver Benjamin, 
who decided he wanted to start a, a religion uh, based on the movie, the, the Coen brothers movie, the, the Big Lebowski. He wanted to start a religion called Dudism, about this character, the dude in the movie. And he felt that this character was very uh, Taoist in nature, and he wanted to use my interpolation as the, the dudist Bible. He wanted to call it the Dude De Ching. And uh, I said, as long as you make it free, sure, go ahead. And he did. And a couple of years later, he has 500,000 followers. And I thought, oh, gee, if people are going to take it that seriously, maybe I should do it properly. So um, now we're going back about 10 years. Um, and so I started trying to figure out what I was going to do with this thing. And when, when I got into it, I realized that um, that to give it a concrete context, I would need to relate it to something that um, the audience would understand already, that it would relate to something that people were doing, something that is in the real world today. And that's kind of where we, we get to agility. Um, but um, part of my motivation for doing this was also um, I started to recognize that there were correspondences between what I'd been doing in the Agile world. I, I was involved in the early days, before it was called Agile. Uh, I, I had a credit in Kent Beck's first book. I ran the second XP program in the world. Um, and I, I, there's a phrase in the book, in every English translation of Lao Tzu, um, uh, the sage. Uh, the sage is apparently a very cool guy. Uh, he, he, he does all of these very wonderful things. He's very enlightened. He's, he's awfully clever. He's basically, he's the next best thing to Lao Tzu, apparently. Um, so, so in you... fact, just, just to interrupt you, he, uh, when you say the sage, you mean when, you, when the, the book talks about someone, he says, the wise man will do this and this, or the sage will do that and that, right? That's what you mean, in fact. Well, that's what most translations do. But when you look mm -hmm. at the Chinese, um, which is what I, I wound up doing, I went, okay, well, let's really do this properly. Um, what we're looking at here is a little section from um, uh, the, the Hatcher transliteration, um, at the, starting at the spot under one's feet. Dolph picked me up on this and said, most translations have a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And in what I was writing, it was, begins with a spot under one's feet. And he said, well, why do you do that? And I said, because it's the best way of interpreting the Chinese as I understand it. Um, so those little word choices, they, they, they are important because there are reflections of these words all through the, the poem. And so in, in Hatcher's transliteration, he does a lot of cross-referencing of the different Chinese pictograms so that you can try to understand them in context. And this is critically important because this is a book that originated before there were dictionaries, before there was silk, before there was paper. The earliest editions were carved into bamboo slats. Um, and I thought that this was a Chinese poem to begin with. Um, so I didn't realize that it was not. It wasn't until um, I started looking at where people who had tried to translate it got their context, their inspiration from, that I realized just how much of a, a Chinese puzzle box has been made of something that actually looked to be very simple. So, but getting back on track, um, the sage uh, in Chinese is Sheng Ren. That's what it's supposed to be translating. But Sheng Ren literally at least one idea about literally because for every pictogram in the poem there are dozens of choices about different meanings that you could apply to it it's like the world's biggest crossroads right, this is why we decided to put this slide here right so we yeah. see how many ways are there to to translate one phrase and i i'd like to just focus about uh, this specific page because uh, well, he, we will the people but I still need know. to make the connection sure. I want to make certain we have the connection to agility before we do mm -hmm. if that's okay Doc. sure so 
Shengren, the sage. Shengren is literally the lively ones, the agile. So when I realized that correspondence, then everything else in the poem takes on a, a different light. Now with this section, um, actually this is a pretty unambiguous section. Uh, there are many word choices where there are many dozens, up to a hundred different meanings for a particular word. So what's the right choice? What's the, what, to put it into context, what does it mean? It comes down to what does the translator need it to mean? Uh, we're talking about a poem that when it was tied up in bamboo slats, there was no publishing. There was one or another version of this poem was given to one or another nobleman in one or another generation of one or another dynasty. And that nobleman may or may not have been literate. So let's say they weren't. Well, then they took the bamboo slats tied up in string, they threw it into one or another basement where they molded for generations until finally there was some young skion of the same house or a different house who found this thing and went, oh, it is the wisdom of the ages. This is all this stuff about this guy riding this ox that I've heard about. This will finally tell me what I need to know to be able to, to run my daily affairs, keep my concubines in order and uh, avoid having too many uh, silly battles with other people. But the string had rotted. The bamboo slats were all jumbled up. And that happened over and over again for thousands of years. So, Dov, you tell me, where do you want to go from the spot under our feet now? Yes, so first of all, <laughs> I'd like to say one thing about this phrase because uh, for me, this phrase, uh, or which normally people know as uh, a journey of a thousand li or a thousand miles starts with a single step, is a very interesting connection. Miles. What? Well, it says 360 miles if we take it literally, it's not even a thousand miles. Yeah, so th th that's what I wanted to say. There's tons of ways to interpret it. And the question is, do you want to be exact on the distance that you're going or to say a thousand miles, which means a long way, but also the base of this phrase for me is uh, in the Agile context is when you want to go a long way, when you want to do a, a big project, start with very small steps, start one step at a time. And what I liked about your translation is that it says, don't even start with one step, start with realizing exactly where you are now before even taking one step. And that's one of the beauties of your translations that I found in relevance to, to agility. He, there are things that you translated it in a very different way from what I know. There are some that uh, you nuanced, like this one. And I just wanted people to see that uh, we talked about this a lot between us. All the translations are legitimate and uh, the translations are um, opinionated. So the way someone translates it, depends on their mindset or where of on what is their position on the ground when they do the translation so that's mm -hmm. that's where i wanted to go with this slide is it okay with yeah. you yeah i think that's a nice place to to go with this slide um all right I, I, there was one thing i want to say before we move on for, about this um so i said before that this may not even have begun in china um we have uh well with Chirag, we, we have an Indian tradition in our audience. And, and there was a very uh, long and deep correspondence of ideas between China and India over a long period of time. So you might go, well, maybe there's some influence of the Vedas on the Vatsu ideas. But it's not even a matter of maybe. There's a, a Sanskrit scholar, uh, Professor Victor Meyer, who um, published a, a translation of the uh, Ma Wang Dui, uh, the Silk Scroll edition of, of, uh, of Lao Tzu, which is the second oldest that we, we possess today, um, years ago, uh, 20, 30 years ago. Um, and um, 
Maya in doing this translation felt that he was he was inspired. There was there's something that was pinging him. And the more of it he did, the more he realized there were deep philological connections between Lao Tzu and the Bhagavad Gita. And he concluded, when you read his translation, he concludes that either uh, one is a bad translation of the other, or both of them are uh, translations of some lost common oral tradition. And uh, certainly when you look at Lao Tzu, there's so much of the way that it rhymes in Chinese that it, it, it derives from an oral tr uh, tradition for sure. Um, the Bhagavad Gita, well, this is an, a, a, a wonderful epic poem that on first blush doesn't seem to have much to do with Lao Tzu. But that, again, it comes down to translating things from one historical context, from one personal context to another over long periods of time. The one thing we can say about the Gita is that um, it was nowhere near as chopped up, it was nowhere near, nowhere near and as bodlerized as the Tao was in China. Okay, the next place I would love to go is to give the audience a taste before we start talking about the, the, the agility aspect of, uh, of the book itself. So perhaps we can start with uh, your translation of the first verse of the book, which sure. is, is, ah no, sorry, before that we had one more story. Would you like to, to go there? Because we are halfway through our journey of today. I, I, I'll, I, I am a windy person. I, I tend to gas on at length, but so I, I'm relying on you to rein me in. Um, but let's, let's touch on this one because it's a very common question as to, well, how does this relate to Buddhism? How does it relate to Confucianism? And there's this famous picture, the, the vinegar tasters, um, which to, to me, it always looks like um, uh, Ron Jeffries and, 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 and Ward Cunningham and, and Kent Beck, the, the originators of extreme programming, the, the original um, uh, Agile school uh, back in the, the 90s. Some people think that Scrum was the original school, but actually, um, while there was an article on Scrum, the, the new new product development method by a couple of Japanese guys, what we know as Scrum today came later. Uh, and while it built on uh, that tradition, really this Agile stuff got its start with Ward and Kent and Ron. So in this picture, we have uh, Confucius and Buddha and Lao Tzu uh, all tasting vinegar. Uh, Confucius is the guy on the left. He's, he's kind of got a scowl on his face and he's, he's tasted the vinegar. He's gone, this wine is sour. This wine is not good to drink. We should not, this is not right. We, we, need, to, we don't need to have rules about what to do with wine because this is bad. Um, and then you've got Buddha Who's, who's tasting it and going, well, this is indeed, this is bitter. We, um, and, and just like, just like this is the kind of suffering, we, we must rise above this. Um, uh, if, we, if we live right, we don't have to experience um, the bitterness as bitterness. Uh, we have to learn to accept this and transcend it. And then you have Lao Tzu who's smiling and uh, he's going, you know, this would be really good with pickles. I think we could use this for pickling a lot of things. This is, we, uh, this, I, I, I reckon we, we can, we can get a lot out of this. Um, so uh, you have the Taoist idea of harmony. It's not just a matter of accepting as a mode of transcendence. It's an idea that things that may not be pleasant simply haven't been aligned well and that we can always find ways to adapt. And that idea of adaptation is where Taoism goes in a slightly different direction to Buddhism. Um, Taoism, in some ways, at least in some traditions, began as a reaction against Confucianism. Uh, certainly, if you read Chuang Tzu, he, he's not shy about having a go at Confucius. So there's a story there, slightly different to your origin story, Dov, um, where um, Confucius, actually, this is, this is one it actually comes from a guy named Su Ma Qian, but um, it relates to, uh, what are you telling me? You're sending me things. Uh, I have to switch windows. Too many details. Oh, well, okay, sorry. Um, 
<laughs> Maybe just tell me too many details. You don't have to type it because otherwise I'm going to get flipped between screens. Anyway, um, so uh, the, the Sima Qian story is that um, uh, Confucius heard about Lao Tzu. He wasn't called together by the emperor. He heard about him and went to confront him because he didn't like what he'd heard. Um, and uh, he went armed with all of these, you know, the wisdom of the ancient masters. He was going to go and, uh, and have it out with him. And so he, he confronts Lao Tzu in Lao Tzu's library and because um, he was the imperial librarian, at least in the story. And, and he quizzes him to death of all of these, stories, these questions and, and all of these. And here's this important stuff. And what do you think about all that? And, um, and Lao Tzu basically says, well, I, I think you should stop reading books and go and study nature. Um, and um, so, so Confucius was, 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 was outraged by this and returned to, um, to his disciples. And, and they said, well, well, boss, what happened? How did it go? And the story is that um, Confucius uh, responded, well, I can catch fish and I can shoot birds with a bow and arrow. I, I can trap rabbits. I have no idea what to do with a dragon of mist and wind. So um, enough about the vinegar tasters, I think, Doth. Yes. Um, just to, to keep us on track for time, we have uh, about 25, 27 minutes. And I would still like, because before we go into agility, to read through the first verse of the book. Cool. And this is yours. Oh, man. Uh, ah, OK. So you'd just like me to give this a reading? Yes, please. Okay. Life isn't the breath in your lungs, nor mind the thoughts in your head. Mind is the course of all thoughts, and life its source. Thoughts represent forms. Forms express thoughts, each generating the other in waves on the surface of mind. And beneath the surface, formless and silent, boundless and liquid, dreams a dream with no dream. And I want to give just a little interpretation of this before we move on, if that's okay. Yes. Yeah. It's more so than okay. So for me, for me, the, the beauty of, of this, so there's a lot I could say about the word choices here, but I don't want to do that now. We'll take too much time. Um, but the beauty of this idea that mind is a continuous surface and all of the forms involved, you and I and everybody else who's listening, that we're waves on this surface, that there is a, a continuity beneath the surface that we can't express using ideas, that there is um, something about the source of thoughts that can't be uh, described with thoughts, um, that when you try to understand beneath the surface, a dream with no dreamer. This is not an appeal to atheism. A dream with no dreamer. The idea is that the dream itself is another way of um, describing what is beneath the world of thought. Um, so if the world of thought of uh, thought and form, the, the wave of interaction between the two is continuous, then the dream with no dreamer, it, the is kind of the, the water beneath the surface that, that you can't see because you can only see the surface. And this connects me to, to uh, one thought I have about this is that in our work as agile agents or uh, people who try to help an organization uh, reach agility, um, we have to learn how to see the organization without the people. We have to, or it, it would be great if we see the organization as an entity within its own. Like uh, imagine, a, a, I don't know, you can say a, an organization without managers, right? And organizations without employees. A, the idea that an organization has its own a, personality, has its own will, that is not necessarily connected to the will of any one person as strong or as meaningful as they are 
in the organization that, that it connect to your interpretation of, of this yeah verse. yeah uh, and and my experience too uh, when you start coaching i think most coaches have this weird experience that when you have an idea that you're going to become an agile coach you think it's going to be one thing of course it's another um and one of the things that that really surprised me when i first started coaching was that it wasn't about the conversations that i would have with individuals it was about the flow of the conversations they would come back to me altered through different individuals and i i began to see the people i was working with less as individual people and more as um uh, as channels for a flow of learning and once you start to engage with that flow of learning i think that's the first step in actually doing or being uh, an agile coach is to begin to understand that you are not worrying about uh, how do i mentor an individual but that's, that is part of what you're worrying about but you're worrying about the rules of the game not the st strategies of the players and that's still way way more artificial and constructed and uh, stilted than what what that's us trying to get at. and actually i think that there is a degree of discomfort for agilists in reading something as abstract as this uh, what on earth do i do with this day to day so I, I i love this first chapter partly because it's an incredibly tough puzzle box to solve to give you an idea the very first line of this chapter if we were being hyper literal about it it reads the Tao that can be dowed isn't really the Tao. What do you do with that? It's using the Tao as, as a verb. It's, it's, it's making some weird distinction between uh, the two, which are, two words which appear to be the same word. Um, when you start to invest yourself in trying to achieve a translation, it's not just about trying to translate the words. It's about trying to find a way of translating them that will generate meaning not just for one line or one stanza or one chapter um but uh, a, a a way to bring meaning to all of this and to refactor it into something that actually conveys something of value to people so this chapter yes it's abstract as hell but it gives us a the spot under our feet it gives us a place to start and from this spot we can get a lot of things that are very valuable to an agilist. So just before we move to the next section of, of our talk, which will be more agile specific a little bit, I'd like to, to say to, to the listeners who probably don't know the, the Book of Tao as much as, uh, as you or I, um, the normal translation or the the the, the most popular translation of the word Tao is a way and uh, your choice of translating Tao as life is uh, is an interesting one that gives again gives the book a, a much more interesting uh, meaning or point of view than the, than I saw with a lot of other translations. Yeah. Um, I think that that particular word choice, uh, uh, Tao as way, um, while it works in some parts of the book, if you look at that first line, the way that can be weighed isn't really the way. Ah, it, it's it's doggerel. Um, it, uh, it offended me the very first time I, I, I went and understood that was really what that line was about. Um, so I think that for anyone who approaches this work, uh, that kind of um, feeling that there is something wrong with the way that this book is constructed. That challenge, that's really what draws people into making a translation. I've been working on this translation for 30 years, um, and not because I set out to, but because it became very useful to me, the understanding, the way of dealing with the world and with the problems that I see in an agile context that it was it became enormously valuable to me so i think we should probably move on from this one dov 
before everybody mm -hmm. who is more interested in Agile <laughs> falls asleep. So let's move on. Now, the, you wanted to talk about three aspects of agility. And the first one is agility as a way of working. Hmm. So I think this is the one that's most accessible. Um, everybody who has done a Scrum course, everybody who's read the XP books or everybody who's into Kanban, anyone who's worked in an Agile team. Um, and I don't mean Agile in the sense of, oh, we do a stand up every morning. We ask ourselves three questions. There's someone named a Scrum Master, there's someone named a Product Owner. I'm talking about Agile in the original context. Ward Cunningham originally said that Agile is effective collaboration. I picked this picture because you can see there's a lot of people who are working in different combinations and there's a joy to the body language. There's something about the way they are doing things where you can see that there is a liveliness to their conversation. Um, I, I think that when we talk about agile mindset, we're trying to get at this in the first instance, but there is more to it. And um, maybe we go to the second uh, slide here. Uh, three minutes to end of slide. That's very exciting. Let's just go on, mate. Um, <laughs> okay, next slide. So um, as a way of organizing, um, a lot of the work I've been doing recently in Xscale Alliance is around the concept of an agile organization. Um, there are plenty of people who talk about scaling agile, uh, it's taking these agile teams and somehow bolting them on to a traditional command and control hierarchy uh, in such a way that they'll still function and the hierarchy itself won't be disrupted. Um, to my mind, that's that loses the idea of an agile organization. We, we need to be thinking in terms of embracing change, of the organization embracing change. So collaboration, yes. But embracing change is where we also connect to the DAO because uh, a lot of the fundamental ideas of adaptation we touched on with the vinegar tasters, that's what we want to see in the organizations that take Agile in. And most of the time, easy 80%, maybe 90, 95% of the time, Agile transformations do not generate Agile organizations. They generate organizations that maybe have a little bit of Agile at the leaves, but the branches and the root, no. There's not, no real change the way that people communicate. And most of the aspects that we would think of, we would associate with Agile, face-to-face -face communication, um, the, the customer focus, small teams, uh, rapid feedback, they don't exist in these organizations. Uh, and I'm not trying to bash something like, like SAFE, uh, big room planning. Yeah, there's lots of things that you could poke at and go, well, that's, that's not right. But what's not right is what's missing in SAFE, what's missing in the idea of scaling. And what's missing is this idea that of we, we want to have an organization of self-directing portfolios, of self-managing streams, of self-organizing teams. So this is where we have an idea in Xscale of triple loop learning. Um, that each of these little squads is focused on learning about its workflow um, to improve its workflow. Uh, they, they, they take part in streams that uh, are focused on improving the flow of value to market. And when it comes to the portfolios, we are focused on trying to improve the flow of learnings through the organization. Without that focus, without the metrics, without the analytics that go with that focus, we don't get agile organization, no matter how well we scale. Okay, and the third part about agility is this one, which is the, I think the most interesting one. Okay, so um, this is a picture we have borrowed from um, a North American First Nations people uh, who are known to Europeans as the Iroquois. They call themselves the Haudenosaunee. Um, 
which uh, literally translates as either the people who build or the people of the longhouse. And these were, uh, this was a, an agile civilization, at least by my standards, an agile civilization. Uh, you might question whether that phrase has any meaning, but the more you find out about the way these guys uh, lived, um, when live, I mean, they're still around today, but for 500 years, uh, the Haudenosaunee were one of the main political powers on the North American continent, including 200 years of, of uh, close interaction with Europeans. Uh, they only came to grief politically during the American War of Independence and then the War of 1812. But the way that they organized themselves um, involved um, an ability to adapt to each other and to adapt to the natural world around them that was fully sustainable, that was, um, uh, that was harmonious despite huge changes that they faced in their situation. And so while you might go, wait a second, what do American Indians have to do with, with a Chinese book? Um, what they have to do with it is the way of life conforms very closely to the kind of beautiful ideas you find in the, the latter part of Lao Tzu, um, particularly the very last chapter. Okay. And now let's talk really briefly about the history of the book. Or you know what, perhaps we covered this already, unless you want to add anything. Um, I will add something. So we, we, I think we've already given two very different interpretations of, of Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu as a, a human tradition, as a book that has been writing itself by being interpreted and reinterpreted by many different people in many different cultures over a very long period of time. Um, the bamboo strip version you have on the right hand side there, um, that's the, the Guo Dian, the earliest uh, rendition of, of Lao Tzu that we've been able to discover. But um, it might not have come from India either. Uh, Victor Meyer, the gentleman I mentioned, uh, he uncovered uh, the remains of, um, in the Tarim Basin in China, the remains of people who had red hair, who were over six foot tall, who wore tartan and um, uh, witches hats, um, uh, mummies that date back 10,000 years, possibly the first people on horses to enter China. We don't know where these ideas came from. Um, so while the history of the book, we can talk a lot about uh, the different editions and what happened and where, how we got to where we are today, for my money, we have not taken the history liberally enough. When we look at most English translations of the book, or for that matter, most Chinese translations of the book, since all the Chinese versions are translations, um, what we've got is stuff that is too timid. It's as if we were trying to assemble a crossword puzzle by polishing the pieces and not trying to reassemble them. So the Agile Tao is an attempt to reassemble them, to refactor them into a consistent harmonious whole. Whether it's the only consistent harmonious whole, let somebody else have a go at doing a different one. I've spent 30 years on this one. Okay. Yeah, let's talk about the last slide before the questions. And this is something intentionally I didn't talk to you about. So why are you doing this? I don't think I am doing this stuff. I think I, didn't, I got infected by this, this challenge. I, I've been a problem solver for most of my career. And here was the biggest, thorniest, most insoluble problem. And I went, okay, well, I can't resist it. Um, so that's part of, that's not really a very good reason though. People approach this kind of work because they're looking for answers themselves. And I was looking for answers myself. Um, I, I came from a very mixed tradition. Um, I was raised by people who had fled from wars and had sworn off religion of all sorts. Uh, but I wasn't, I wasn't getting the answers I needed from the people who were around me. Um, I was second and third generation in Australia 
and the ideas I grew up with uh, didn't relate me to the culture around me and I had to figure out how to make sense of the world for myself. So I think part of the Agile DAO was me trying to combine uh, a set of cultural influences and see whether I could find a way to use the poem to um, express something that would answer my questions. So it, it, is, it is now a, a very close translation of the Chinese. I don't, I, I didn't take any liberties in the translation that um, it's, it's extremely consistent to when you look at the transliterations, um, which is from, from, from me, who I'm not a native Chinese speaker, that's the closest I'm going to get to it, but it, that's fine because this poem wasn't originally written in Chinese. So being that close is adequate. I've read every English translation I can lay my hands on. Does that mean that any one of those translations is better or worse? Originally, I thought what I was doing was, um, was kind of taking too many liberties. But as I started to go through it pictogram by pictogram and to really try and figure out, okay, if this is a jumbled poem, then how do we unjumble it? How do we get something that really hangs together where there's a flow, there's a beauty to the poem as a whole and not just one or two lines here or there? Um, that's where I found that the poem was speaking to me, that I was discovering things that I know I didn't put into it, but which were valuable to me. So it became a cycle of, it's more a conversation between me and the tradition and trying to respect the tradition, but also trying to avoid the trap of respecting it too much and leaving the problems unsolved. So that's why it's so very different to the other translations, which don't try to reorder the text at all. All right. I'll tell you why I'm doing this. And when I say doing this, I mean um, mix, trying to mix the, the ideas of uh, Taoism and uh, agility and having this uh, a webcast, for example, is um, when I first read the Book of Tao in a wonderful Hebrew translation by Nisi Mamon, I felt that I got exposed to, to, do, to a very ancient wisdom. And it's only after I read a few translations that I realized that a big part of what I fell in love with was the person who did the translation, was his viewpoint. And when I got to read your book, um, it was the first time that I saw the mix of someone who's agile oriented, whose mission in life, or one of your missions in life, is to bring agility into the world, if I, the, sorry about the cliche. Um, and I love this viewpoint on this text because I think most of what we talk about is ourself. When we talk about books we read, we, we talk about ourselves. When we interpret stuff, it always comes through our viewpoint. And I think the agile way of looking at things can contribute a lot to a better transformation, to a better a way of approaching the journey that an organization or a team takes. So that's why I'm, I'm doing this. And um, perhaps a few words about the, um, there is said, a, how a, do we, yeah. There is, a, there is a phrase we have not used in this conversation that most people would have expected us to use, agile mindset. Um, People talk about this as if it's something that's voodoo and magical. Um, some people go, well, no, Agile mindset is summed up by the values and principles of the Agile manifesto. But even if you take the manifesto very literally, there's something underneath it. Um, one of the things that I love about Lao Tzu is, I, I, to me, this provides a very explicit description of the Agile mindset. And so making it explicit means it's now up for conversation. Now it's something that we can talk about whether this is a good idea, a bad idea, maybe this is a misinterpretation of what agile mindset could be, but it gives us something we can iterate. 
So I feel I did a very bad job in uh, my role as a timekeeper because our time is up. So I have to ask Shirag, would it be possible to dedicate a few minutes to questions and answers? Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. So we, since I can't see any questions on my screen, can anyone who has, uh, who, ca who can see the questions, if there are any, or if you want to pose any, yeah. uh, just go ahead. Drop the question and you can ask the question. Let's see. The only one I see, I see a comment. Uh, gave a very different perspective from looking towards being agile. But um, I think we could have a harder question. I, I don't. I, I like being invited <laughs> as much as anyone else does. But I, 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 I would Especially like to try and shoot, shoot holes in us. Tell us how, why the, we, what we're saying is is silly or doesn't relate. Um, I, I, I think we need we need someone to to play up and tell us. We're just two silly old men who think they understand what's going on, and we don't. Okay, so perhaps while we wait for uh, for a question, let's go back to to this question, which is, uh, how do we hope this will help others? So on my part, as I said. Um, the exposure of this mindset to, to agile coaches or to people who deal with transformation can give a much wider uh, view. In fact, when I read the book, one of the challenges that I had for you is, you know, a lot of teams print the agile manifesto and they put, the, put it on the wall to remind them something that they may forget. What will happen if we take a verse out of the book and put it on the wall of a team or on the wall of, of, a, of a CEO? So he reads it and remembers how would that change the behavior of the organization? And I think this is the one of the exciting exercises that I would love to do with you sometime. Do you um, I think it's a it's a good question, and it goes back to that um, the first chapter where. Um, uh, Thoughts represent forms, forms express thoughts. So the moment you start to change the language, uh, the, this word agile, uh, it, it, it generated a whole step change in the way that people began to approach software. And now we, we see it beginning to develop a step change in the way people approach business. But we have a question here. Where do we start if we are to use DAO and agile? And I don't think we start by putting some words on a wall. Um, I, I think that the the starting point for this, um, I think it, it's deeper than that. And it has to do with the way we, we work with uh, leadership. Um, a lot of the Lao Tzu is advice to uh, leaders, the easy half the book. Um, and um, uh, how do you develop leadership from a basis of mindfulness? Um, and what does agility do for us? If we think of agility as a function, what is its output? Um, the idea in Lao Tzu is that its output has to do with harmony. We're generating harmonious, adaptive collaboration. So um, I think that putting the words on a wall you know, I, I've worked in places where the only thing that was agile was a big curly agile word written on the wall. Um, and, you know, you walk into a place like that to coach and people think that they, they already know how to do it. They, they already have, because look, it says agile on the wall, it must be agile. Um, so I think it's easy for quotes to be used that way. Um, and I, I, I would rather it's a living conversation. I think, in other words, if, if harmony is too fluffy a word, word would be alignment, which is a very popular word we use in the Agile transformation. When everyone is aligned on the same goal, this is harmony. Um, yeah, but um, the, one of the neat things in, in Lao Tzu is that he, he makes it very clear that the moment we start to defend harmony, we lose it. 
Um, so so uh, if we're going to to work as uh, agile exponents and if agile generates harmonious organizations, harmonious value streams, harmonious teams, then uh, I think it's more that there are a bunch of simple practice ideas, practical principles, practical princi principle practices um, that we get from this kind of uh, uh, deep philosophical work that we, we need to express these things in concrete terms. And so we just have a question here. How has your work on the Agile DAO influenced uh, your X scale approach to Agile transformations? That's a very good question because some of the ideas um, we have in X scale around self-propagating transformations derive very closely from that. So, and the, your comment at the start of, of this, Dov, where you were saying that um, what Lao Tzu said to the emperor was, shit happens. Um, I think that's a common Western trope for what Lao Tzu is about. But I don't think it's very accurate. Uh, it, it refers to a phrase in the book, uh, Wu Wei, um, which is much more around the idea that um, self-organization, self-management is really what we're trying to develop in these organizations. So uh, if we if we can um, introduce that and grow it as a capability, um, rather than trying to to push change into an organization, that idea of growing a harmonious organization. There's lots of um, uh, parts of lots of chapters in Natsu that uh, refer to that idea. And the Wu Wei idea uh, it comes from the notion that um, the more the organization manages itself, optimizes itself, the more it is a, a feedback-based organism that is trying to optimize business throughput, the less there is for command and control leaders to do. And that if we have the ultimate expression of an agile organization, um, then all they really need to do is to try and control themselves to take their own uh, competitiveness, their own egotism, their own tendency to um, to lay hands on it and refrain from that. Once it's in a purely self-organizing state, that's not to say that it'll stay that way. There's a lovely line in that suit that um, uh, the captain of a, uh, a great ship does not lead it as a jade figurehead, but steadies it as a stone keel. Um, I think I, I think your English about... is too high for for the audience, or at least for me. Okay, um, so a uh, jade figurehead, jade was, was precious stone in China. So you know, when you have a boat, you have a, a figurehead on the front that, that that leads it is is basically kind of um, taking credit for the beauty of the ship. Uh, the idea in Natsu is that no, there is a stone keel underneath that is steadying it, so that no matter what direction it needs to go in, no matter how it needs to tack in changing winds. Uh, it, it will be able to maintain its um, flow through the water. I, I, I think that that's where um, the, a lot of the advice in that to a leader becomes useful. So to answer the question, um, if I have to relate something that is uh, a, a poetic and philosophical expression of... Um, of an approach that you can take to working in the world, to something that is instead a very concrete set of practice patterns that we can use to apply to solve very specific kinds of problems in business agility, product management, DevOps. Um, yes, it's all connected. Does the connection do anyone any good? I never have thought that it has. And that's why when you look at the Xscale stuff, you don't see anything about the Agile DAO. I never tried to express it explicitly because I, I felt that um, it would make people feel that what we were doing at Xscale was kind of woo-woo, new age stuff. Um, but the connection is important when it comes to leadership. So one of the things we're thinking of doing in the second half of this year, uh, there's a, a gentleman at the uh, Swiss University of Applied Sciences, Andres Pfister. He's, a, uh, I think I'm going to mention that, he's a doctor professor there. And Andres, has, um, he's professor of leadership there. So we want to put together uh, an, a fourth course in X scale, uh, 
uh, right now in Excel's business agility and product management and DevOps, we want to have a course on mindful leadership where we can take the ideas that come from the DAO and Andres's very practical experience. Um, and we have several other folk involved in Excel Alliance who also have deep, um, not just experience of leadership, but deep experience coaching uh, executive leaders. We want to bring this together into a, um, a body of knowledge that's really properly informed and owned by the community. So this is not some one person saying here is certified agile leadership, but instead a learning ecosystem that is trying to take everybody's best ideas into this to try and grow uh, mindful leadership and bring the experience of leaders in. So there's uh, there's an emphasis in the X scale on learning ecosystem instead of training hierarchy that also comes from that. Okay, I think this is a great idea for the next podcast that we should have. And uh, yes. uh, <laughs> unless there, there's any uh, one more interesting question that someone asked. Is there, Shira? Uh, I yes. think we covered. Uh, yeah, so where do we start if we are to use Tau in Agile? I think uh, Peter's answer, right? Yeah, I think we answered it. Yeah. All right, so why don't we look at it this way? This book, The Agile DAO, uh, it's uh, on LeanPub, it's in beta on LeanPub, you can see the link on the screen. Um, the free sample basically consists of the entire text of um, of the work, what's what's not free there is a set of appendices I'm still working on. Um, and by all means, if you feel like it, go and, and, and buy a copy. But what I would really value is if um, if this conversation leads to feedback there, uh, that would be great. So um, so maybe this is the start of a conversation. Anyone who's interested in trying to come to grips with this in an agile context or in a personal context. Um, any feedback there would be very valuable to me. So just one word about this. I, I would love to uh, continue this uh, intention that we have in this uh, talk in a series of uh, podcasts that uh, we do together. So if anyone is interested, I, I guess we have the list of the people who are subscribed to this talk and we'll uh, keep you updated once we have something like this. And also, uh, I've pushed here a link to the Xscale Alliance, of course, and to a, a game that I created to improve meeting culture, which takes a lot of the ideas of being mindful and the ideas of uh, Taoist mindset to tweak a little bit the way that people do work meetings uh, to a more mindful and focused state. So this was the small push of uh, like a self-publication. And uh, thanks a lot for joining me. Uh, I think you can go back to sleep now, Peter. Oh, I think that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Right, thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so joining. much, uh, all. Yeah, thank you so much, all the participants. And you know, thank you so much, Do and Peter, for joining us today. And this session is really, really good. And hoping to see you in future as well. No Take worries. care. It's a pleasure. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.